Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. Before we begin, please be aware, we have a tendency to swear. You have been warned, make no mistake, so join us now. We're We're for Fox Fox Sake. Sake. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Carly, and the punny Gryffindor to my right is Ellen. I am pretty Gryffindorable, aren't I? You are indeed. Speaking of puns, let's fly into the Phoenix flashback. Hee hee. Last week, we covered the second half of Chapter 4, Horace Slughorn and the corresponding film scenes. Dumbledore takes Harry to meet an old colleague, who we quickly realize is the most ambition-seeking Slytherin. Dumbledore leaves the two alone when he has to pee. After a few awkward remarks about how surprising it is that Muggleborns can do magic, Harry is unsure of how he feels about Horace Slughorn. The book always provides more information than the movies. However, we still get the perfectly splendid line of I do love knitting patterns from Dumble. Old Sluggy agrees to return to the school and our plot line thickens. During episode 201, yo, I gotta pee, our Potter pondering was, do you think Slughorn had Tom Riddle's picture up on his display? And if so, at which point do you think he took it down? Hello, hello, it's Jackson here with my Potter pondering. I reckon Slughorn definitely had Tom Riddle's photo. I mean, up until everything went down, he was a model student. Well, model as in the teachers never saw what he did, but... Yeah, he was one of Slughorn's favourites, so he definitely would have had his photo up. When would he have taken it down? I don't know, probably a few years later when he revealed himself as Voldemort, or at least started to um, reveal himself as Voldemort, maybe. Not exactly sure when, but a few years after he graduated, maybe. Hi, this is Jessica calling in my Potter pondering of... When did Slughorn take down the picture of Tom Riddle from his collection? Well, this begs the question of when Slughorn found out that Tom Riddle was Voldemort, because most people didn't know that they were the same person. There were obviously some Death Eaters who attended Hogwarts with Tom who knew, but it wasn't common knowledge, especially considering his special award for services to the school was still in the trophy room. This could really be a deep dive, but back to Slughorn. I think he probably understood better than most that Voldemort and Tom Riddle were the same person because of the information that he gave Tom. And, you know, Slughorn loved to keep tabs on his students so he'd have more knowledge of the comings and goings of his star pupil. Especially when Tom returned to ask for the job at Hogwarts and he was visibly changed because of the evil magic that is required of making the Horcruxes. But I don't think he destroyed his mementos until Lily was killed. He talks about his Lily flower fish that she had given him and about how like when he found the bowl empty he knew that she was gone and given the fact that you know she was in the order of the phoenix and you know basically number one on his to be killed list he knew that it was Voldemort that had done it you know before it became very well known obviously. I think he stacked up his pictures like in that moment and destroyed them And I think that's also when he altered the memory and quit Hogwarts. Now, this is a really interesting topic, though. I'm very intrigued to hear, like, what everyone else thinks. Okay, bye. Hello, this is David with uh, Potter Pondering. I think that Slughorn did have Tom Riddle's picture up there. And I think that even after he turned into Volby, I think he left it up there. Because I think that in his mind, he wants to separate a good student from the evilest wizard ever. And so he wants to think that he contributed into the rise and success of a good student. And in his mind, he won't allow himself to think badly of his prized student. So I think he kept him as a trophy up probably the whole time, if he could. If not, 
he might have taken it down just caving into social pressures, you know, the internet and stuff. Nagging on it. Didn't want to get canceled. So, all right. Toodaloo. Michaela wrote, I think he did at one point in the past, but then after everything happened and he must have realized that Tom Riddle had created Horcruxes, he took down any photos he had of him and then wiped his memory. Probably wanting to forget because he regretted ever telling him about Horcruxes in the first place. Kendra said, I actually don't think that Slughorn would have ever put up Tom's picture. Tom may have been a smart student, but old Slug would have waited until he made it big before putting up his picture. Going to Borgen and Burks wouldn't have done it. Remember they talk about later in this book that it surprised everyone? They were expecting Tom to do so much more and then he disappeared for a while. When he came back and started doing his death muncher thing, at that point, Slughorn wouldn't have put his picture up for obvious reasons. That's my thought. Thank you so much for your responses. Our trivia question last week was, what does Molly like Arthur to call her when they're alone together? Apparently, Molly likes to be called Molly Wobbles. Congratulations goes to Kalista White Wolf. Yay! They interrupted Kalista's streak last week, but now she's back. Think she's going to start up a new one? You never know. For now, let's dive into the first half of Chapter 5, An Excess of Phlegm, and the corresponding film scenes, if they can be called that. Chapter 5, An Excess of Phlegm, Part 1. Harry and Dumbledore approach the back door of the burrow, and after Dumbledore knocks three times, Harry sees movement behind the kitchen window. Mrs. Weasley's nervous voice calls through the door, asking who is there. As soon as Dumbledore says it is him bringing Harry, the door opens and Mrs. Weasley is standing there in her old green dressing gown. She exclaims that he gave her a fright because he had said not to expect them until morning. Dumbledore ushers Harry over the threshold and explains that they were lucky because Slughorn was much more persuadable than expected. He gives Harry the credit, then notices Nymphadora Tonk sitting at the kitchen table with a cup of tea and greets her. Harry looks around to see her too, and as she says hi to them, he thinks she looks a little sick, with something seeming forced in her smile. She's definitely less colorful, as her hair is mousy brown instead of its usual bubblegum pink. She thanks Molly for the tea and sympathy, and says she better be off. Dumbledore tells her not to leave on his account, because he has to go meet with Rufus Scrimgeour. Tonks insists she needs to get going, and Molly tries to invite her to come to dinner that weekend, but she says no and tells everyone good night before hurrying past Harry and Dumbledore, out into the yard where she disapparates. Dumbledore then tells Harry he will see him at Hogwarts, and bows to Molly before heading into the yard himself and vanishing from the same spot as Tonks. Mrs. Weasley closes the door and steers Harry to the table before commenting on how much he has grown and asking him if he's hungry. Harry says he is and sits down at the table while she begins to get some food together for him. A furry ginger cat jumps up on his knees and settles down, purring. As Harry scratches Crookshanks behind the ears, he asks if Hermione is there and learns that she arrived the day before yesterday. Mrs. Weasley tells him they are all in bed since they didn't expect him for hours and uses her wand to serve him some onion soup. She also offers him bread and as it magically soars over to them and slices itself, she asks him about persuading Horace Slughorn to take the job. Harry has a mouthful of food and can only nod and Mrs. Weasley continues talking, telling him about how he taught her and Arthur and also asking him if he liked him. Harry gives a noncommittal shrug, and Mrs. Weasley says she knows what he means because he can be charming when he wants to be, but he never had much time for Arthur. She mentions how even Slughorn can be wrong because Arthur has been promoted. Harry swallows a mouthful of hot soup and gasps that it's great. Mrs. Weasley tells him he's sweet and explains that Rufus Scrimgeour set up several new offices in response to the present situation and Arthur is now heading the Office for the Detection and Confiscation of Counterfeit Defensive Spells and Protective Objects, and has ten people reporting to him. Harry starts to ask about what he does, 
and Mrs. Weasley cuts him off to tell him that, in the panic about you-know-who, a lot of odd things pop up for sale that are supposed to guard against him and the Death Eaters, but they're often fake and sometimes even dangerous, like a box of cursed sneakoscopes that was likely planted by a Death Eater. Harry asks if Mr. Weasley is still at work, and Mrs. Weasley says he is and is a bit late because he thought he'd be back around midnight. She turns to look at a large clock that is sitting on top of a pile of sheets in a washing basket, and Harry gets the impression that Mrs. Weasley has taken to carrying it around the house with her. It has nine hands, each inscribed with a family member's name and pointing at mortal peril. Mrs. Weasley tries to casually say it's been like that ever since you-know-who came back into the open, and that she figures everyone must be in mortal danger now, not just them. As she's saying she doesn't know anyone else who has a clock like that, Mr. Weasley's hands moves to point to traveling, and then there's a knock at the back door. She hurries to the door and asks if it is Arthur. Mr. Weasley's weary voice says it is, but also says that he would say that if he was a Death Eater, so she needs to ask the question. Molly protests, but then asks him through the door what his dearest ambition is. When he says it is to find out how airplanes stay up, Molly tries to open the door, but Arthur won't let her until he asks his question first. Molly again protests, but he asks her what she likes him to call her when they are alone together. Even in the dim light, Harry can see Mrs. Weasley is blushing, and he tries to eat his soup noisily to drown out her response. Molly wobbles. Mr. Weasley declares this to be correct and allows her to open the door, revealing a tall, thin, balding, red-haired wizard in horn-rimmed glasses and a long, dusty traveling cloak. Mrs. Weasley tells him that she doesn't see why they have to go through that every time he comes home, as a Death Eater could have forced the answers out of him before impersonating him, but Arthur insists that it is ministry protocol and he should set an example. He then comments on something smelling good and asks if it is onion soup as he turns towards the table and sees Harry. They shake hands and Mr. Weasley sits beside him as Mrs. Weasley brings him his own bowl of soup. Arthur thanks her and starts talking about how tough of a night it was, since someone started selling metamorph metals, meant to let you change your appearance at will, but really they just turn someone a fairly awful orange color and some have sprouted tentacle-like warts all over their bodies. Mrs. Weasley thinks it sounds like something Fred and George would find funny and starts to ask if he's sure, but Arthur interrupts her to insist that the boys wouldn't do anything like that to those desperate for protection. Mrs. Weasley then asks if the metamorph medals are why he is late, and Arthur explains that they had gotten wind of a nasty backfiring jinx in Elephant and Castle but magical law enforcement had already sorted it out by the time they got there. Harry stifles a yawn, but Mrs. Weasley isn't fooled and sends him off to bed, telling him that Fred and George's room is all ready for him and he will have it to himself. Harry asks where they are and learns that they have a flat in Diagon Alley over their joke shop since they're so busy. She says she didn't approve at first, but they have a flair for business. Then hurries Harry to bed, letting him know his trunk is already up there. Harry says good night to Mr. Weasley, and they make their way to the second floor as Mrs. Weasley checks her clock again and sees all the hands are back to mortal peril. Once in Fred and George's room, Mrs. Weasley uses her wand to light the lamp on the bedside table, and Harry thinks he can detect the lingering smell of gunpowder. Much of the floor space is filled with cardboard boxes, along with Harry's trunk. Hedwig hoots happily at Harry before taking off through the window to hunt. Harry then says goodnight to Mrs. Weasley, pulls on his pajamas, and climbs into one of the beds, falling asleep nearly immediately. What feels like seconds later, Harry is awakened by what sounds like cannon fire as the door bursts open. He sits bolt upright as the curtains are pulled back and the room is flooded with sunlight. He shields his eyes with one hand and gropes for his glasses with the other as he drowsily asks what's going on. A loud excited voice exclaims that they didn't know he was already there and he feels a blow on the top of his head. A girl's voice tells Ron not to hit him and Harry manages to find his glasses and put them on. The room is so bright he can still barely see but after blinking a grinning Ron Weasley comes into focus. 
He asks if Harry is all right, and Harry responds that he's never been better before returning the question. Ron says he's not bad and asks when he got there since his mom just told them. Harry lets them know that it was about one in the morning. Hermione settles on the edge of the bed as Ron asks how the muggles treated him. Harry says they were the same as usual, mostly not talking to him, but he prefers it that way. He then asks how Hermione is. She says she's fine as she stares at him intently. Harry thinks he knows why and doesn't want to discuss Sirius's death or any other miserable subject at the moment, so he quickly asks what time it is and if he's missed breakfast. Ron tells him not to worry since his mom is bringing up a tray, then asks what's been going on. Harry tells him it's been nothing much, but Ron doesn't buy this since Harry had been off with Dumbledore. In response, Harry explains that it wasn't that exciting. He just helped him persuade an old teacher to come out of retirement. Ron looks disappointed and begins to mention what he thought they'd been doing, but a look from Hermione makes him say they thought it would be something like that. Harry is amused and questions this, but Ron runs with it, saying they obviously need a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher since Umbridge has left. He asks what he's like, and Harry describes him as a bit like a walrus before asking Hermione, who is still intently watching him, if something is wrong. Hermione manages an unconvincing smile as she insists nothing is wrong and asks if Slughorn seems like he'd be a good teacher. Harry says he doesn't know, but also states that he can't be worse than Umbridge. A voice from the doorway claims to know someone who is worse than Umbridge, and Ron's younger sister enters the room, looking irritable. She says hi to Harry, and Ron asks what's up with her. Ginny sits next to Hermione on Harry's bed and explains that she is driving her mad. Hermione sympathetically asks what she's done now, and Ginny complains about how she talks to her, like she is three. Hermione lowers her voice to agree and call her full of herself, and Harry is shocked to hear her talk about Mrs. Weasley like this. He can't blame Ron for angrily asking the two of them to lay off of her for five seconds, but then is very confused when Ginny snaps at Ron for defending her, saying they all know he can't get enough of her. Harry starts to ask who they're talking about, but is cut off as the bedroom door flies open again. He yanks the covers up to his chin so hard it sends Hermione and Jenny toppling to the floor. An extremely beautiful, tall, willowy blonde young woman is standing in the doorway, emitting a faint silvery glow and making the room feel as though it has become airless. She is also carrying a tray laden with breakfast, only making the vision even more perfect. Laura Delacour sweeps into the room to greet Harry as a rather cross Mrs. Weasley appears in the doorway behind her. The movie section starts out with a very dark view of the burrow at night, visible only by the few lights on within the house. There's a swishing and a splashing sound, followed by a gasp and more water sounds as the camera pans down to show Harry standing ankle deep in a shallow body of water. He picks up his foot, looking down at it as he shakes it off, then sets it back in the water and begins walking through it. The camera focuses on his face as he reaches the edge and stares happily at the burrow before it cuts to the interior where Jenny walks into the living room and picks up a book. She notices Hedwig and Harry's trunk and sets the book back down before running from the room calling for her mum. The scene shifts to show a low-angle view of the many levels of staircases in the burrow. As Mrs. Weasley leans over the railing and calls back to Jenny, asking what is it. The camera changes to show Mrs. Weasley's view of her daughter at the bottom of the stairs as Jenny asks when Harry got there. It switches back to Mrs. Weasley asking what and Harry who before cutting to a high angle on Jenny saying Harry Potter of course. Mrs. Weasley makes her way down the stairs insisting that she would know if Harry Potter was in her house. Jenny explains that his trunk and owl are in the kitchen, and as Mrs. Weasley leans over the banister and says she doubts that, Hedwig screeches. Appearing over a railing at a higher level, Ron asks if someone said Harry. Mrs. Weasley looks up at her youngest son as Jenny answers she did and asks if Harry is up there with him. Ron says he isn't, and he'd know if his best friend was in his room. From an even higher level, Hermione's face pokes over the edge, asking if she heard an owl. 
The camera cuts back to Jenny as she asks Hermione if she's seen Harry, who is apparently wandering about the house. Mrs. Weasley then exclaims, Harry, and Jenny runs back to the kitchen where Harry is now standing. Jenny runs straight to him and gives him a hug, soon followed by Mrs. Weasley, Ron, and Hermione. Hermione and Ron each give him a hug in turn, then Mrs. Weasley, who is happily laughing as she asks him why he didn't let them know that he was coming. Harry responds that he didn't know and only needs to say Dumbledore as an explanation. Mrs. Weasley accepts it, saying, oh, that man, but also wondering what they would do without him. They're distracted by Ron, who is reaching a finger towards Hermione's face. He awkwardly explains that she has a bit of toothpaste, and Hermione chuckles. Aww. <clears throat> right? I hate the awkward, like, romantic comedy moments that they put in this movie. And that's just the start of it. They get worse. Well. We'll get there. Lav Lav enters the picture, so yes. Lav Lav. Oh, boy. Anyway. Any who's it's. So, basically, the only thing that's the same from this book section to this movie section is the fact that Harry is at the burrow. <laughs> and there are Weasleys and Hermione there. There's no Tonks. There's no Arthur. There's no conversation happening between Molly and Tonks at one point or another. Yeah, and Dumbledore just drops him in the water. What is that, like a swamp? Is it a little creek? What is that water there? It's a marsh. It's a marsh. Sure. Dumbledore just drops Harry in a marsh and says, peace out, yo. I gotta go pee. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He's old. Even though he went back at Sluggy Slug's place. He's gotta go He's again. Got the bladder the size of a walnut. Man. Yeah, it, that's it. They're at the burrow. Nothing else is the same because when Harry gets there in the book, yes, Mrs. Weasley is there having that conversation with Tonks. Dumbledore walks Harry all the way to the door after having a full conversation with him that we did not get to see in the movie last week. Which would have been a very good conversation to see. Right? Which we talked about. But. Yeah. This is pretty interesting, too, because it sets up, not fully, but it is like the first little foundation of Tonks and Remus's relationship that just sort of appears out of nowhere in the series, in the movie series. I feel like it also kind of appears out of nowhere in the book series as well. They do start to give this solid foundation in this book, but it's very, like, it feels very random. But I'm sure that's because it's not real. I know it's not real, but it, we're not seeing the background. Like, they probably were stationed together several times and had lots of long conversations, and Remus is dreamy, so... Dream is Lupin. Dream is Lupin. Oh, I do love him. Obviously, we don't know that's what's going on yet, but we know something is going on with Tonks because her hair is not colorful. In the books, it's normally pink. The movies like to do it purple. I bet pink didn't read well on film. It may not have looked good on her either. That's true, because they did choose to change Hermione's dress to pink because the periwinkle didn't look good on Emma. Though I don't believe for a moment that it didn't look good on Emma. Well, I think they wanted her to stand out more from the decorations, too, because everything was like silvery bluish white. Ah, uh, that's true. I don't know. I like the way that this is described, though, because Tonks is usually this bright, bubbly person, and she clearly is going through a bout of depression. Yeah. And it's you can see that. And her hair is... Interestingly enough, kind of described like Remus's hair, mousy brown. Yep. I think having her be in this kind of depressed state, but also still looking like the person she loves, once you look back on it, it's that person is still with her and keeping her from being too terribly off. Yeah. And we see little hints of it as it goes on whenever she's involved. Right now, she's just trying to pretend like, everything's okay, and the only real noticeable signs is the mousy brown hair and the fact that when she says Watcher to Harry, he feels like her smile looks a little forced. And if Harry is noticing that, it's probably pretty noticeable. Because Harry's not that observant. He's not a Ravenclaw. 
At this point, Tonks thanks Molly for the tea and sympathy and says that she's got to go. And Dumbledore tries to tell her that she doesn't have to because he can't stay. Apparently, he's got to go meet with Rufus Scrimgeour so they can argue again, I imagine. And pee. And he's got to pee, yo. But Tonks insists that she's got to go. And Molly offers to have her come back that weekend for dinner, specifically saying that Remus will be there. Remus is going to be here. They do know. At this point, right? Her and Arthur know. Molly definitely does. That's why I assume she was there talking to her. I mean, Arthur eventually knows because he says something at the end of this book. Molly Wobbles talks about it. Oh, yeah. I'm positive that Arthur knows everything Molly knows. I'm sure. Married couples, you Fossil know? privilege. Yeah. But she just says bye to everybody, goes out the door, hits a specific point in the yard, and apparates away. And I'm kind of wondering if they have it set up where that is the only point that you can apparate from for security measures because it specifically states that Dumbledore disapparates from the exact same spot. Unless you go further out from the house, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Of course, he leaves after telling Harry that he'll see him at Hogwarts and he bows to Molly and says, Molly, your servant. And I just love his formality. I don't know why. It's appealing. I like to think that Dumbledore has this very profound respect for Molly. I think Molly is probably an extremely talented witch. And I think that people look down on her because she chose to be a stay-at-home mom. But being a stay-at-home mom, one, is no joke. No. And two, doesn't diminish your skills as a career person or as a wizard or as a witch or whatever. I think that Molly probably put up this stuff on the house. I know that the ministry helped put the protections around the house and that they're checking the mail and doing all that stuff but i definitely think molly has her own sort of mom protection around it oh for sure mama bear Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's a little comment that we see later on that i want to touch back on this a little bit more and we get to it in relation to molly oh okay but yeah so dumbledore leaves molly closes the door after him and then of course does her usual you look way too skinny. Are you hungry? To Harry. Both look like you've had stretching jinxes put on you. Yeah, she also comments on how much taller he's getting. Ron, too. But definitely too skinny needs to eat. So Harry, having had this quite adventure of the evening and apparently has been asleep since seven, like maybe he had dinner, maybe he didn't. Who knows if the Dursleys were feeding him properly. But he realizes he is hungry. So he takes a seat at the kitchen, and while Mrs. Weasley's getting together some onion soup and bread for him, Crookshanks comes and jumps on Harry's lap. And he gives him scritchins and then goes, oh, so Hermione's here too? when she get here? And apparently she arrived the day before yesterday. I hate this. It feels so exclusionary. It feels like Harry had no idea that Hermione was at the Weasleys, like, at all. It feels very exclusionary, and maybe it was Hermione and Ron wanting some time alone together. But if that were the case, Ron wouldn't be such a freaking duffer during this book and be like, oh, if Hermione wanted to blah, 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 then she should have said something. Like, no. So if that is the case, I don't know. It feels weird to me. It feels like Hermione is being intentionally exclusionary of Harry. I don't know. It's tough to say because there is that theory going around that Hermione has already memory charmed her parents to not know who she is. Yeah. And that they're already in Australia. Yeah. I agree with that theory heavily. However, my thought process is, does Mrs. Weasley know? And I kind of think she does. If if that's I the case, she I think would. she would. And I think maybe Hermione's excuse for coming like Ron obviously doesn't know because he's sometimes a sack of rocks but not always he is smart but sometimes he's just dense emotionally he has the emotional range of a teaspoon yes there is that so sympathy for how she's doing this and understanding why she did it wouldn't be his forte (laughs) yeah and I wonder if maybe the invitation was extended to them at the same time and Dumbledore just couldn't get him till Friday, but Hermione was able to come sooner. That's fair, because her parents are already in Australia. Yeah, she has nobody to be like, no, you can't go, or no, stay with us a few more days, or we need to have a guard take you there. So I profoundly, I super think that that's canon. I think that she has already Because it is kind of weird that 
she just never stays with her parents essentially ever Anymore. again. Yeah, yeah, it's just it. Especially with how much she talks about them. And even in the seventh book, when they go to the Forest of Dean, she talks about how they used to go camping and yeah. all that. St- and her heart is just a little broken. And you can tell how much her parents mean to her. But if they're already in a safe place and she's already keeping that a secret from her two best friends, that kind of surprises me. But I also understand why. Yeah. Anyway, Mrs. Weasley tells Harry that everybody's asleep because they didn't think he was going to be there until the next morning. And then, like, serves him the onion soup using magic. Yum. Onion soup. I know. This is making me hungry. And then while he's eating, she asks him about the whole thing, persuading Slughorn to take the job. Like, oh, so you managed to persuade him. And Harry's got a mouthful of food, so he just nods. And this is when Mrs. Weasley says that he taught her and Arthur and also asks him if he likes him. So this is the second time that Harry's been asked if he likes Slughorn. And for the second time, Harry just kind of like, uh, I like sure, he whatever. Shrugs. He just shrugs, noncommittal, like, okay. I picture him with a mouthful of bread being like, oh, oh. And Mrs. Weasley says that she gets it. She calls him charming when he wants to be and specifically says, but he never had much time for Arthur. Arthur's wonderful, but she's so brimming with excitement here. Right. But this is the thing. She says he never had much time for Arthur. Specifically. For Molly. Did he pay attention to Molly? Was yes, Molly talented witchy? Yeah. Was Molly like Ginny that just impressed the shit out of him? I mean, she's pure blood. We know she's powerful because what she pulls off later on in the book. The Weasleys are a very old family. Mm-hmm. Well, she's not a Weasley. She's a oh, no. Pruitt. Pruitt. Yes. The Pruitts are a very old family. I'm sure her brothers were very talented. Yeah, I'm sure they were too. And I would imagine being from an older family, pure blood, all very talented, that she probably did get attention from Slughorn. And her only reason to be upset with him is that he didn't see how great Arthur was. To be fair, he also doesn't see how great Neville is. Well, at this point, Neville is a very talented wizard. He just isn't talented in the way that Slughorn thinks is important. I was going to say Slughorn's not a Ravenclaw. (laughs) Well, that too. So on the Harry Potter wiki, there are a sacred 28 group of families. So these are from the Pure Blood Directory, the 28 British families that were still truly pure blood by the 1930s. So the sacred 28 include a lot of people, including the Black family, the Lestrange family, the Gaunt family, the Ollivander family, and the Pruitts. Mm-hmm. And Weasley is on here too. Slughorn is also on here, and Selwyn, which is Umbridge uses Selwyn as her pure blood. She says, oh, the S on the stands, for Selwyn. stands for Selwyn. Parkinson is on here. There's a lot of names that are Death Eaters, but also a lot of names like Longbottom and Malfoy. Well, Malfoy's were a Death Eater. <laughs> Avery, Caros, Crouches. So these names are really interesting because there's a specific note of the Sacred 28. So I think that would have been a big pull for Slughorn to be like, a Pruitt, absolutely. And there's enough Weasleys walking around the school that he's like, oh, I can just pick from whoever. And right. Arthur is not impressive to me. Or he was interested at first and then tapered off from it. Like he's yeah, done maybe with students it's a in this bottom. one type deal but yeah so she brings up how he never had much time for arthur but then is so excited she's so cute i love it about how even slughorn can be wrong because arthur has been promoted and she shares this with so much excitement right as harry is taking a large mouthful of hot soup that all he can do is gasp and like choke on the soup but manage to say that's great I love that he's so excited for Mr. Weasley. It's so sweet. And he talks about how the soup burns all the way down, but he's so excited it doesn't matter. And he loves this family. He does love this family is his family. Yeah. Even before he marries Jenny. So it's wonderful. It's like his dad getting a promotion. Yeah. And the most worthy family of it. Oh, definitely. And I love she just like pats him on the cheek and tells him he's sweet. 
Such a mommy. Yeah. And then she goes on to explain that the new minister, Rufus Scrimgeour, is setting up different offices in response to the present situation. And one of them is the Office for Detection and Confiscation of Counterfeit Defensive Spells and Protective Objects. That is what Arthur is now heading, and it's still right up his alley. It is. And this sounds like a super important job. Yeah, he's got 10 people reporting to him. Well, also the stuff that they're doing, like pulling stuff off of the market that are like dangerous. Yeah. Because Mrs. Or, Weasley says there's lots of things that are really scary, but then there's just some fake things, you know, but sometimes right. those sneaker scopes that he has, there's like cursed. Yeah. And they think they were planted by a murder muncher. So oh, yeah. he is definitely doing a lot to help protect people. And I think it goes along with his work with muuggles and muggle artifacts and different things like that because I'm sure murder those could munchers, be objects charmed as well. Yes, I'm sure that the murder munchers are trying to kill some innocent bystander muggles as well. Oh, that's not even a, I'm sure they're doing that. They're doing that. Yeah, they are definitely <laughs> That's doing a thing, that. absolutely. Yes. Harry wants to know if Mr. Weasley's still at work, and he is. She's a little worried because he's kind of late. And she references her clock, large grandfathery type clock. It's a grandfather clock, isn't it? So the way that they have it in the movie is... It was, wasn't it? It was a grandfather clock. However, in this specific part in the book, he says that she's carrying it around in the laundry basket. So So that makes me think that it's one of those that has like the grandfather clock face and then has like the ticker at the bottom, but it's not Not the whole tall big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I have one of those, so. But anyway, this clock we've heard about before that each of the nine hands points to where the family members are and they're labeled with their names. And in this instance, as you said, she's carrying it around with her. So Harry gets the impression that she's just keeping it with her at all times. My heart. Which makes sense because everybody's hand is pointing to mortal peril. I feel like she's staring at Percy. That's possible, too. All of them, really. I know that they're all in mortal peril, but he's the only one that's not near her. Yeah. Well, the twins aren't now either. Neither are Bill and... Yeah, but they still talk to her. That's true. So, like, she doesn't know what's going on with Percy at all. Can I just comment on the fact that you cut me off before I could say Charlie's name and now he even gets left (gasps) out of the podcast? No, he's my favorite! (laughs) Charlie's my favorite. Yeah, so not... Bill and Charlie. Fred and George. None of them are living at home anymore. No, but they at least still talk to their mother. That's true. Like you said. She tries to very casually tell Harry that ever since you know who's come back, their hands have been pointing to mortal peril, and she figures that they're not the only ones, but she doesn't know anybody else who has a clock like that to check. I wonder who gave them the clock. I'm sure they got it on their wedding day. I wonder if you can just, like, add more hands to it then, if it's just magic. Maybe she made it. I don't think she did because she said she doesn't know anybody else with one like it, which makes me think that they did. It's like something that was a wedding present. Yeah, maybe she might have made it, but it sounds like an anti-murial gift. If you ask me, I could see that. And I bet the hands just appear when a new Weasley is born. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Speaking of hands at this point of the conversation, Mr. Weasley's hands just moves to traveling (laughs) and Molly's like, oh, he's on his way back. I like that it goes back to mortal peril. Yeah. (laughs) Like, oh, he's traveling, not in mortal peril while he's traveling. They probably aren't really accessible at that moment if it's an apparition thing, Mm, you know? And then I kind of wish that it went from traveling home, mortal peril, just to illustrate this is where he is. (laughs) They don't say, but that's what I like to believe. I like that too. And then there's a knock on the back door and Molly's positive that it's Arthur because he was just traveling. So naturally he's coming home and she goes to the door and says, is that you, Arthur? And he says, it is. But I would say that if I were a murder muncher. So you need to ask the question. (laughs) This is ridiculous. Like, it's you. I know it's you. Who else it's going to be? And finally, she's just like, all right, what's your dearest ambition? I love this, and I would love to explain to Mr. Weasley how airplanes stay up. Yeah. Physics. That's what it is. <laughs> to find out how airplanes stay up. I kind of wish that had been the question instead of no. the rubber duck one. Oh, that one, yeah. Because Harry would have been like, 
I uh, have no idea. Which he didn't answer the rubber duck question either, so. Because what is the function of a rubber duck? Well, we asked that already. Mm -hmm. And by we, I mean you and Katie, but still. Yep. Anyway, after he answers his question correctly, Molly tries to open the door, but he's literally holding onto the handle no. on the other side and won't let her because he has to ask her her question, too. Why would you make this your question? <laughs> Because <laughs> who else is going to know that? I guess who else will know. I wonder if there's different security questions for different people. Oh, yeah. No, that's totally this their, is security, their question. security question. And Arthur is not expecting his son's best friend to be sitting in the kitchen listening into this conversation. Son. But then he says through the door, what do you like me to call you when we're alone together? Mm. And even though... It's pretty dark in the kitchen. There's just like a lamp. Harry can absolutely see that Mrs. Weasley is blushing. Her bright red hair's red. coming oh, down yeah, onto no. her face. She just looks like Cousin It all red. <laughs> Cousin It. So he tries to eat his soup as noisily as possible. Like slurp, clatter the spoon. Just anything he can do. There's another human in here. Please right? stop. Please stop. Or anything he can do to not hear the response. <laughs> which is... Molly Wobbles. Which was our trivia question. It's adorable. Molly Wobbles. Is it about the boobs? That's what we think. All about that boob. About that boob. Molly Wobbles. <laughs> yes. yes. Mr. Weasley knows for sure that this is his wife now, because who else is going to know that? That is correct. <laughs> and now finally lets her open the door. Open the door. So we see Mr. Weasley, the tall, thin, balding, red-haired wizard, with his horn rim glasses. He's got on a dusty traveling cloak. I don't know how much of a raise the promotion came with. But at this point, I feel like they've got to be doing better because they only have two kids to pay for I was anymore. thinking that, yeah. Because Fred and George are off living on their own. Bill and Charlie are living on their own. It does get cheaper as your children get older. Yeah. Sometimes. But I love this because Mrs. Weasley makes the same point that Dumbledore did, saying, I don't see why we have to go through this every single time you come home. A murder muncher could have gotten the answers out of you by now. And Arthur says, yes, but it's ministry protocol and I work for the ministry, so I have to set the example. It's true. I love him. I love Mr. Weasley so much. And I'm sure he is actually hungry in this moment as well, because that sounds like a really long day. And who knows say, if he got to have dinner. Hours? But I also feel like he has been married to this woman long enough to know how to deflect. And he just goes, eh, something, something smells good. good. <laughs> good job, man. Good job. Yep. And says, oh, is that onion soup? And he turns towards the table. And this is when he finally notices Harry. Oh, Lord. And I would have loved to see this scene this play out in the scene. movie. I would have loved just the little nuances of Molly's embarrassment. And then the reaction of Mr. Weasley realizing that they just had that exchange in front of Harry. Harry yes, and, oh, yes. it could have been so cute. But we got no. bilked. We did. Ew, David. Ew, David. I like that they shake hands. For I him. know, they shake hands. And Arthur sits next to him and Mrs. Weasley brings him some of his own soup. And then he thanks her, which is always so sweet. You should always thank your partner. But starts talking about how tough of a night it was. Apparently somebody started selling metamorph metals, which Ugh. is supposed to be a metal that would give you Tonks' powers, essentially. Yeah. And instead, they're fake, and they just have been turning people orange. Well, Tonks said that you have to be born as a metamorph. So... There might be real metamorph metals. Maybe. But maybe they can't do everything right. that Tonks can do. It sounds like these were supposed to have certain disguises built into it yes and then you just look like donald trump yes or sprout tentacle like warts all over your body which is that not looking like donald trump i'm confused i thought you were referring the orange color but you know what all of the above all of the above a carrot this kind of upsets me actually when i first read this because Mrs. Weasley initially thinks that that sounds like something Fred and George would find funny. 
I mean, probably, but they also understand at this point what's at stake. And that's exactly what Arthur says. He's just like, absolutely not. The boys would not do anything like that to people that are desperate for protection. They like their jokes, but they okay. have a line. They actually sell protection products to the like ministry. legit ones. Yes. Yeah. Because they're really good at magic. Yes. Everybody thinks they're just goofballs, but they are really good at magic. Yes. Even Hermione says their little swamp thing is impressive. Yeah. Flitwick says it is. She says something about the love potions being impressive, too, and the breeding of the pygmy puffs is impressive. Yeah. Because it is. Which is why it bothers me that Mrs. Weasley thinks that they'd actually do things that could harm people in these times. I don't think she legitimately thinks that they would do that. I think she just thinks that they would think it was funny. I don't know. I read it like she was accusing that they might be doing something. They might I be the think ones. Yeah. She's becoming around to the joke shop, but I think she still wants it to be a bad thing. I think she probably did a mom thing where their grades reflected how she saw their smarts and that's not a measure of their magical ability oh not even a they little turned bit ron's teddy bear into a spider when they were five years old that's some really good magic yeah or they were seven but still you're not even a full-fledged wizard yet and you're transfiguring a object into a living object but they come from two of the sacred families like they do come from two of the sacred 28 but you know so does Neville, and lots of people also doubted Neville's abilities, but it's just how it is. I think that she's seeing it from a mama standpoint, that yeah. their grades weren't good. How could they make a life out of a joke shop? They should work for the ministry. However, I think at the end of five, Mr. Weasley says something like, oh, she doesn't really seem to care about the ministry aspect, any or maybe Fred and George say it. But something about not caring about the ministry aspect anymore because the ministry obviously is not the best place for everybody to be. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting, the difference between Fred and George and Neville is Molly had high expectations for them. She always expected them to do better than they did, whereas Grandma Longbottom. She had extremely high expectations for no, Neville. No, she never expected him to succeed. She always, like, assumed he wouldn't be oh, able to. I assume differently. I assume that she had super high expectations for her grandson, and when he didn't meet them, she was just consistently disappointed in him. Because she even specifically said, like, oh, he's a good boy, but when he meets them, like, she doesn't think he is capable. She wishes he was, but she doesn't think he is. And I think that made Neville believe he wasn't, and that's why he wasn't living up to his potential. Yeah, we can also talk about toxic grandma Longbottom. yeah. We could have a whole Potterheads history on Toxic Grandma Longbottom. Yeah, it could definitely be up there. Anyway, the metamorph medals is what Arthur brings up. And Molly wants to know if that's why he's late. But Arthur says that they also had information on a backfiring jinx. It was apparently really bad in Elephant Castle. So they went to go check that out. But by the time they got there, magical law enforcement had already kind of fixed it. So he was able to just leave from there. Is Elephant and Castle a town? Something. I don't know. Some place that she would know because he specifically says Elephant yeah. and Castle. So, yeah, I don't know. Harry tries to stifle his yawn because at this point it's getting pretty late. But he wants to hear about what's going on. He wants this update. But it doesn't fool Mrs. Weasley who says, all right, bedtime. Good night, Harry. You're yawning, Mr. Man. Yeah, we saw that. She also tells him that he's going to be in Fred and George's room, not sharing with Ron like he normally would. And he'll have it to himself because they're not there. They get to stay in the flat they have above their shop because That's they've so been cute. very busy. And it's at this point that she says she didn't approve at first, but they seem to have a flair for business. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's she's getting it. She's coming around, but I don't think she's there yet. I don't think it clicks until they go to the shop. Yeah. But she tells Harry that his trunk's already up there, and Harry says goodnight to Mr. Weasley, and Molly leads him up the stairs to the second floor where their room is. And as they're getting ready to leave, she, like, checks the clock one more time, and now everybody's back on mortal peril. And then once they're in the room, she lights the lamp with her wand, and it specifically says that Harry can kind of smell a lingering scent of gunpowder. And I love, like they're just like, 
experiment with shit in their room. How big is their room? <laughs> it's big enough for two beds and a whole bunch of cardboard boxes. Are we sure they didn't have bunk beds? It doesn't say that there are bunk beds. It just says that Harry picks one of the beds. Oh, yeah. So that would make me think side Yeah, because you'd think like Harry took the bottom bunk or Harry took the top bunk. It yeah. just says one of the beds. But like I said, the floor is filled with cardboard boxes that are all sealed or closed. Not necessarily sealed, but they're closed. And then Harry's trunk is there and Hedwig's hanging out. Mm. And she just hoots at Harry and then flies off. And it says that Harry knows she was just waiting for his arrival before she goes hunting. She's a good owl. She is a good owl. Who's a good owl? Hedwig's a good owl. She is. Here's an owl treat. Boop. Who's a good girl? You think she went and got Pigwidgeon and they're like, Beast, we're going hunting. What can Pigwidgeon catch? It's like a teeny tiny frog. (laughs) Little field mouse. (laughs) Harry and Mrs. Weasley say goodnight, and she leaves him alone to get in his pajamas, climbing into one of the beds, as I said, and he falls asleep almost immediately. That sounds so comfortable. Yeah, now he's got a full stomach, had a busy night, his owl's good, he's with the people that he loves, he's got a bed. (sighs) It is dreadfully atrocious that we don't get any of this in the movie. We get this farcy moment of them on the stairs being like, Harry, 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 until Harry's like, shut the fuck up. Yes, I'm right here. Yes. Right. It's just silly and farcy. And I'm just like, y'all, what in tarnation? It was so extra. And unnecessary and extra and unnecessary. And And repetitive and redundant. redundant. (laughs) (laughs) It just kills me every time. I'm just like, what? Wait, what? Why are we doing this? And like you said, when we were going through the summary that we edited it out, but like you said, to have Hermione be on the floor above Ron when Ron's room is supposed to be right below the attic, like he's the top floor. Maybe they were making out. She was brushing her teeth, apparently, if she had toothpaste on her face. Maybe he went to a lower bathroom to brush his teeth, too, so that they could make out. Maybe. If you don't know the uh, geographic layout of the burrow, Ron's room is in the attic. So he has the coolest room, point blank. So it would make no sense for him to be lower than Hermione in the staircase nonsense. No, I don't think the movie paid any attention to the logistics of the burrow. Well, I wish they had. I could have stopped. I don't think the movie paid any attention to the logistics. Correct. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, none of that. I really wanted it. I wanted more of the Burroughs coziness shown. They don't do a good job of that in the movies. The Burrow is such a comfortable, cozy place always. It's literally Harry's second favorite place in the wizarding world. Yeah. So my house, I always try to make like the burrow. I have blankets everywhere. It's very cozy. We always have our fire on when it's cold outside. I try to make sure my house is as comfortable as possible. And I think it would have been so nice for them to show that in the movie with how the burrow is supposed to be. And just to take this moment to show Harry go into Fred and George's room and show a little bit more of Fred and George's characteristics yeah. instead of the weird... Hermione, Ron, and Harry sitting up in, which we don't get to at this point, but they're sitting up in Ron's room and, you know, talking. Like, that's not, it does look cozy in Ron's room, but it's not that same feeling. And they could have gotten that feeling with Tonks and Mrs. Weasley sitting at the kitchen table sharing a cup of tea and sympathy. Tis true. Sympathy. Sympathy. But overall, I hate how the movies do the burrow. It's not what it needs to be. And then, you know, setting it on fire. (laughs) Well, (laughs) we'll get there. Oh, my God. We're going to shred that apart when we get there. But we're here right now. So let's keep talking about what's going on in the book. It literally goes straight from Harry falling asleep immediately to waking up what feels like seconds later. To what sounds like cannon fire. (laughs) Yeah, the door bursts open. I love the fact that Ron is so excited to see him that he's hitting him. And Hermione's like, don't hit him. They're already married. (laughs) I know. It's so funny. It reminds me of my cousins. So I have all male cousins except for like one is a girl. 
Yeah, on my dad's side of the family. So my cousins got to spend the night together at one point. My One of my cousins had to live with my other cousins. And every morning he was so excited to wake up, he would smack his head on the upper bunk because he was on the lower bunk. So he would wake up so excited he would just hit his head. And you'd hear ping throughout the house. And so that's how one of my cousins always knew he was awake because he was like shooting up out of bed because he was so excited to be there with them. And that's what I imagine this moment's like. It's very Aww. cute. Yeah. And it's very sweet. I love that Ron is so excited. He's like, bestie, what? Yeah, <laughs> it's very sweet. The bestie, what is great. But at the same time, it's kind of a dick move because he like shockingly wakes him up, pulls the curtains well, over true. to let the sunlight glide. Harry is so disoriented that he's like shielding his eyes with one hand and trying what to find his heck? glasses with the other. And when he manages to find them and put them on, he still can't see what's going on because he just his woke up and it's adjusted. really fucking bright in there. I was going to give Ron the benefit of the doubt that he didn't know what time Harry got there or what time he went to bed or anything, but opening the curtains is a dick move. Let him wake up on his own. On his own. Let him do that. I mean, I feel like I would politely knock on the door, even if I was very excited, just to let him rest. It is entirely possible because... They've probably been up for a while at this point. Like, it's not long after this that Mrs. Weasley's working on lunch. That's true, yeah. So they've probably been up for a while. And, and at it's... this point, Mrs. Weasley's getting breakfast on a tray together for Harry. And they were like, what's going on? And she's like, oh, Harry's sleeping upstairs. I'm just getting him some breakfast. And they're like, Harry's upstairs. Yeah. So she had maybe intended for him to be woken up by that point. But it's still... A very excitable but dickish way of doing it. I would probably murder somebody who woke me up like that. No way, Jose. Oh, I am cranky if you wake me up. You and my husband. Len, too. It is... He I'm might be not. worse than me. I'm usually... I'm usually not too bad. You know what? I'm less bad, if I'm being honest, I'm less bad about being woken up, and I'm worse about being kept awake when I'm trying oh, yeah, to you sleep. Are, you're, you're angry when I, you get kept awake. But eventually, Harry does adapt to the brightness in the room and the blurry, brightened silhouette that comes into view is a grinning Ron Weasley. He's an angel. Yes. And I love this because he asks if Harry is all right. And despite the shit that Harry has going on in his life, he responds that he's never been better. And honestly, that's he probably hasn't. true in this moment. He's so happy to be there and be with his friends and be out of the Dursley's house. And he probably is feeling pretty good in that moment, if not a little bit cranky because he got woken up very suddenly. I feel like Harry's used to that, though. Honestly, that's how Aunt Petunia used to wake him up. <laughs> probably. <laughs> it's true. Harry also returns the question, asking how he is, and Ron says he's not bad, but then wants to know when he got there, because like I said, he just found out that he was even there. And you were right. They didn't know what time he got in, because he's like, yeah, it was like one in the morning. Fuck you for waking me up, dude. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Hermione's there too, because she's telling him not to hit him, you know, and she settles on the edge of the bed, and they're just chatting about how it was at Privet Drive, did the muggles treat him okay? And Harry's like, oh, you know, same old, same old. They mostly ignore me, and that's how I like it. Me too. And he asks how Hermione is, and she says that she's fine, but she's staring at him like she's dissecting his brain and what's going on in there. She's worried about him. She is worried about it's him. It's only been like three weeks. And Harry too. Yeah, three. Fortnight. By this point, I think it's been three weeks since Sirius died. Sad. Yeah. And Harry may not be in Ravenclaw, but he's pretty sure he knows why she's staring at him like this. And he does not want to discuss Sirius's death or any other miserable subject at this moment. He's feeling pretty happy right now. So he just goes, what time is it? Did I miss breakfast? <laughs> Where's Deflect. my food? Deflect. It's like, it worked for Arthur. Maybe it'll work for me. His Hufflepuffness is coming out. Yes. And Ron says, don't worry, mom's bringing you up a tray. What's been going on? Like, you were off with Dumbledore. What's been going on? And it's so funny. He doesn't say you've been off with Dumbledore until Harry says not much. Oh, nothing much. Ron's like, you've been off You're with wrong. Dumbledore. Like, what do you mean nothing much? And Harry says, oh, well, it was kind of boring. He just had me help him persuade an old teacher to come back to Hogwarts. 
And Ron starts to say what I imagine was going to be, oh, well, we thought that it was going to be something about the prophecy. But Hermione silences him. And he, like, goes, oh, that's what we thought it was going to be about. <sighs> and Harry says, oh, yeah, that's, that's what you thought, huh? Is that what it is? <laughs> but Ron just kind of runs with that. He's like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, now that Pepto Bitch Mall is gone, we're going to need a new defense against the dark arts teacher. And then he asks some questions about Slughorn, namely, what's he like? All Harry really gives him is that he looks a bit like a walrus. <laughs> Yeah, but kind of how Harry feels. At yeah, this point. but he's way too distracted to, to continue this conversation because Hermione is still staring at him. So he turns to her and goes, is something wrong? Take a picture. It will last longer, Miss Granger. <laughs> right. And she insists that everything's fine. Wants to know if Slughorn seems like he'll be a good teacher. Meh. Harry's like, I don't know, but he can't be worse than Pepto Bitch Mall. It's true. I think it's so disappointing that we don't get this little character development between these three. Like, they do have a good relationship, and we see that throughout the movies, but there's so much more behind their friendship. We really get surface level. Yeah. And I had originally considered including the next part of the movie section right here because it does kind of line up as well. But I felt like it also lines up because this continues on a little bit longer. So I just decided to split it still a little bit and have some movie scenes for each section of the book chapter. Because it's not like anything they talk about is about the same. It's true. And we do get some of those like deeper moments, like when we get to seven and in the movie, Harry and Hermione do the little dance. That's one of my favorite moments. It's so sweet and just a really good moment to show Harry and Hermione's friendship. Yeah. And how they work together. But I don't think we get a lot of those empathetic, sympathetic, cutesy moments between the three of them, especially in this one, because Ron's acting like a total jagweed, which is normal for Ronald Billius Weasley. Mm -hmm. And all we did get for the rest of this section with these people that are involved in this is them hugging him and then Ron being weird about toothpaste on Hermione. Like, what's on your face? We didn't get any of this sweet friendship moment like you were talking about beyond a hug. They have the conversation in the next movie section. And that's a barely. moment. Barely. But it is, yes, barely a moment. But they do laugh a lot, which is nice. Yeah. So, you it's know, friendship. kind of there. But the best line... I know someone who's worse than Umbridge. Yep, that's when Jenny shows up to join the party, even though she was the first one there in the movie scene. Book Jenny, best Jenny. I love it. She does say that. She says, I know someone who's worse than Pepto Bitch Mall and enters the room, clearly very irritated by something. (laughs) Not her mother. Not her mother. As Harry initially thinks. I can't believe he's talking about her like that. I love it. She just said, she is driving me mad. And Hermione is being very sympathetic. What like, what'd she do now? And Jenny says that she talks to her like she's three. It's really condescending, which Hermione says, oh, yeah, she's so full of herself. And Harry's like, I can't believe you're fucking talking about Mrs. Weasley like this. Get the fuck out of here talking about my mom. And he's not at all surprised when Ron starts defending who he thinks is Mrs. Weasley and then gets really, really confused. Wait, what? (laughs) When Ginny snaps at her brother saying he can't get enough of her. He's like, he can't get enough of his mom. Wait, what? That's no, I'm missing something here. Who? Who? What? He just flat out asks what is going on. But his question is answered when the bedroom door flies open again. And I love the fact that in this moment, everybody that he knows and trusts and is comfortable with is right there in the room. So when the door flies open again, he instinctively grabs the bed covers and pulls them all the way up to his chin so he can't be seen in his pajamas. Pulls it so hard that Hermione and Ginny, who had just sat down next to her, fall onto the floor off the bed. You're redonkulous. But I love the fact that he wasn't concerned about pulling up the bed covers when Ginny walked in. No, he wants her to see the uh, hippogriff tattoo he's got. Much more macho. Kind of makes me wonder what he's wearing as pajamas. 
He might not be wearing a shirt. Mm, it's possible. It's summer. And I kind of doubt that the Weasleys have AC. Accurate. So, like I said, door opens. It answers his question of who they're talking about. When a extremely just gorgeous, willowy, tall, blonde woman standing in the doorway emitting this faint, silvery glow. <laughs> the room feels like it's become airless. And she is carrying a breakfast tray. Which it specifically says makes the vision even more perfect. Harry is secretly a Hufflepuff. Food. And a little bit misogynistic. <laughs> and a little bit misogynistic, yes. And Lord Delacour sweeps into the room to greet Harry, followed by a really pissed off Mrs. Weasley. I mean, girl creeping in on your territory. To be fair, she hasn't seen Harry since they almost died in a competition together. So it's been a while. I too would probably be like, oh, I'll take it up. I feel like Fleur was probably a little condescending about it, but, you know. Yeah, I like watching the relationship between Molly and Fleur develop. <laughs> uh, it gets nicer. Yeah. It starts off a little sassy-assy. But this is where we decided to cut the book chapter because it's a pretty good, like, bam, pretty Here's girl. Your cliffhanger. Yep. Mrs. Weasley's pissed. And we'll find out why next week. Oh, yeah. Unless you've already <laughs> read the books and know exactly what's going on, because you sure didn't see it in the movie. True story. We kind of can talk about Mrs. Weasley a little bit. Yes. She's wonderful. She, Julie Walters. Always could, perfect. Yeah. And then Bonnie Wright, who has far more moments than she did in this one. <sighs> yeah. Don't think it's her fault at all. No, not at all. I don't either. I really just don't like the way they wrote her character. But this is also the first time that we see Rupert Grint and Emma Watson. However, they did such not anything at all in this scene that I feel like we got better moments. We can really talk about them. But yay, they're back. Let me touch your face because there's toothpaste on it. The to toothpaste, toothpaste, toothpaste. Tooth is there toothpaste on it? It was face? so awkward. Well, not as awkward as Jenny tying Harry's shoe, but we'll get to that. Or feeding him. <gasps> oh, my God. Ugh. But Mrs. Weasley had a couple of cute moments. I think it's silly that they had her say Harry who. Like, she didn't like know she was who asleep. Harry. <laughs> and she's, I mean, like, coming possible. out of sleep Mom. and she's like, who? What? Yeah. <gasps> I don't know. It was weird. Is Arthur in this movie at all? Yes. Like, in the shop, and that's it, right? I'm pretty sure we see Arthur. Oh, he is in this movie. You're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Do you in like the weird my confidence scene? in that? Yeah, yeah. He's in this movie. It's just not here. Not here. Not here. Oh, well. So disappointing. We Actually, I want that to be our Potter pondering. Let's move on to That's that. That's true, yeah. So what are your thoughts on how the movie excluded the entire Molly Arthur Tonks scene? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. Or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name, then go into your answer. Don't forget you can also stitch your response on TikTok. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. This week we have a wizarding word, and it's that Hogwarts Legacy was finally released for Switch Woo! just two days ago on November 14th, although you're probably listening to this on Friday, so that case it was three days ago. But you know what? It's fine. It's fine. It just finally got released. I have been waiting for this for ever and ever because they had so many different issues. I mean, it's been available since when on the other systems since right after my son was born so it's been over a year it's been a year ish plus but they described it as delays and unexpected issues because it's such a massive and graphically intense design it really is it's like skyrim yeah but harry potter and let's be fair the switch 
is not anywhere near as powerful as those other systems. It's meant to be handheld. It's meant to be portable. And the games on it are great. I love so many of the Switch games. Now, some of them you can get on other systems as well. But I love Nintendo. I love... It's a Game Boy, but also... It's a Game a Boy Game that Cube. you can plug into your TV. <laughs> yes. Like, it's not as computer heavy that something like the Steam Deck would be or... It doesn't have excellent PlayStation. graphics. There's not really live yeah. games on it. However, I will say the Zelda games look fantastic they do it. but it's not like realistic ish type stuff yeah like the hogwarts legacy game it's is. a little more stylized yes and on top of that the technology for gaming equipment has really increased a lot since the switch first came out yeah. so it's just trying to get that to work with that they probably had to downgrade a lot so despite this nine month to a year delay of the release for the game to the switch it's good timing for the holidays it is and i'm super excited absolutely it's super fun so that will bring us to our trivia question this week's trivia question is how many owls does harry receive the first one who responds with the correct answer and the code word hashtag good will get a sticker Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, then you can write us a recommendation on our Facebook page. Make sure to email us at foxsakepod at gmail.com to let us know you did, and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and TikTok at foxsakepod. Following us on Podbean at Fox Sake Pod will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at ForFoxSakePodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to become a patron... You can find us on Patreon at Fox Sake Pod. Patronage starts at $2 and will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake Swag, access to our Discord channel, chats, and more. Check out our page for details. Any support you can give is greatly appreciated. And join us next week when we talk about the second half of Chapter 5, An Excess of Phlegm, and the barely any corresponding film scenes that don't really correspond much at all anyway. Thanks for listening. Hope you hear us again. I'm Carly. I'm Ellen. And we are... For, for Fox, Fox Sake. sake.